Our next speaker, and the last one before the break, um, is Dr. Todd Roberts. He came from University of Toronto, where he did his internal medicine and medical oncology. Then he won, uh, spent some time in Boston doing a fellowship in bone marrow transplantation with Dr. Ken Miller at Tufts University. Um, Dr. Roberts uh, is the medical director of the uh, only bone marrow transplant program in Rhode Island, which is the Roger Williams Medical Center uh, program. Um, please welcome Dr. Roberts. Thank you. <clears throat> is this, uh, what does this do? I think that's Crazy. only for the trays, and then the other one you can move forward and back. And what's, what's the point here? Uh, with this one. This one? Yeah. Um, this is like a mouse. Exactly. This you can use a pointer as a mouse. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Got that. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Dr. Katz and Espat for asking me to speak today. Um, I know that uh, it's a diverse group here, and everyone has had different exposures to uh, bone marrow transplant. So I'm going to keep it kind of general, and I hope that, that you don't get bored and you all get something out of it. Um, okay, so uh, just disclosure, I am on the Speaker Bureau for Millennium. So first of all, I just want to go through some semantics. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're basically going to be talking about allogeneic transplants today, but autologous transplants are where uh, you use yourself as a, the stem cell source. In allogeneic transplant, there's a lot of um, acronyms that we throw around. So. Uh, match-related donor if you're a sibling. Um, you can be just a sibling or it can be a twin, in which case it's syngeneic. You can be a mismatch-related uh, sibling, um, which is called a haploidentical transplant. You can be a matched unrelated donor, have a perfect match, or you can be a mismatched unrelated donor. So they're M MUDs and MUDs. Or you can have an unrelated source from umbilical cord that can be a single or a double um, umbilical cord transplant. What the hell is that? Okay, um, <clears throat> and also allogeneic transplants can be myeloablative, they can be reduced toxicity or intensity, and non-myeloablative, and these terms get thrown around a lot. So I just really want to concentrate on the myeloablative regimen. This is, um, a myeloablative regimen is the chemotherapy that you get before a stem cell transplant. <clears throat> when it's myeloablative, it's high doses of chemotherapy and or radiation. It completely wipes out your immune system and bone marrow. Um, the reduced intensity transplants, uh, they also will eradicate your bone marrow, but with less toxicity because you use different drugs. And this has become important because this um, extends the age that you can tr transplant someone and also treat people who have other comorbidities. Why do an allogeneic transplant? <clears throat> well. Uh, several reasons to replace the hematopoietic or lymphoid component in disorders like aplastic anemia or other autoimmune disorders, uh, to rescue the patient from myeloidative therapy for treatment of hematologic malignancies, um, to eradicate abnormal hematopoietic system and replace it with a normal functioning, as in sickle cell disease, and to create a graft versus leukemia effect um, <clears throat> with, the, with the new immune system. And, the graft-versus-leukemia effect is um, con connected to the graft-versus-host disease. So that's when you get a new um, immune system from a donor, um, and there may be some HLA disparity at some level, and <clears throat> the graft recognizes that the host is not itself, and it attacks it. That's called graft-versus-host disease. Graft-versus-leukemia effect is when the same response attacks any micro um, Scopic disease that may be left over. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, <laughs> the aim of transplanters is to really separate the graft versus host disease for, from the graft versus leukemia effect, which has not been done yet, but it's the holy grail of, um, of transplant. So, looking at, at transplant activity in the US, the blue, this is autologous transplants. Um, from 1980 up to 2012, you can see there's a big increase. This is where the breast cancer um, studies uh, were shown to be negative. Uh, the green is 
uh, related donor transplants, as you can see, they've kind of um, leveled off because families don't get to, are not getting any bigger. And <clears throat> these are the unrelated transplants, and as you can see that they're on the rise, and that's something that we're going to be concentrating on. So where do you get your stem cells from? You can get them from the bone marrow, you can get them from peripheral blood or umbilical cord. So <clears throat> to get bone marrow, this is when the um, <clears throat> bone marrow transplanters get to be... Oh yeah. There's water if you need. Yes, thank you. So <clears throat> the bone marrow is where we get to feel cool and dress up like surgeons and go into the OR. <laughs> And we intubate the patient, we flip them over, <clears throat> and we harvest their bone marrow um, bilaterally at the iliac crest. Um, peripheral blood is where we give them growth factor for four or five days and then harvest them on an apheresis machine, um, usually from uh, their arms. And umbilical cord is where the umbilical cord is harvested at the time of birth. Um, Regarding bone marrow and peripheral blood, there was long time uh, controversy of whether one is better than the other. Uh, and three years ago at ASH, the American Society of Hematology, this was uh, the big presentation. Uh, the bone marrow transplant uh, clinical trials network did a phase three randomized trial, randomizing uh, <clears throat> donors to uh, bone marrow or peripheral blood cells over a number of diseases. Um, including myeloablative or reduced intensity regimens, and cyclosporin methotrexate or tacrolimus methotrexate graft versus OCC's prophylaxis. And what it showed that there was no difference in overall survival. Um, there were differences, however, in, um, if you looked at graft failure, 3% uh, for peripheral blood and 9% for bone marrow, which was significant. And chronic graft versus host disease was higher in the uh, peripheral blood uh, than the bone marrow. So each have their own benefits and uh, drawbacks. Uh, graft versus host disease is a source of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality in patients. Um, I just showed this, I know it's kind of, I really wanted to show is that these two here, this is uh, neutrophil engraftment, this is platelet engraftment. This was also statistically significantly uh, different. For, for blood you get a quicker engraftment of neutrophils and platelets. So what do people, um, what are sources are we using uh, over the years? So you can see that related bone marrow has gone down and that if you're getting uh, stem cells from a, a sibling, that majority of these now are peripheral blood. Uh, unrelated bone marrow, who they used to, do that all the time, and that has gone down, and unrelated donor peripheral blood has gone up. And you can see that also going up is cord blood. Now this is the latest data from this is 2010 and 2011. Whether the randomized trial data will increase the use of bone marrow harvesting is yet to be seen. And what type of regimens are we using? So the majority of patients are getting myeloablative conditioning. However, as you can see, reduced intensity conditioning, less than 50 years, is, is pretty stable. Most people less than 50 years would get uh, an ablative regimen, uh, unless there's significant comorbidities. But you can see that the reduced intensity um, conditioning regimens in people older than 50 has been on the increase. And this allows us to tr transplant patients up to 75 or even 80 years of age. Who gets a transplant? <clears throat> Autologous transplants, uh, by far the majority, are multiple myeloma, uh, then non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin's disease. Others, uh, maybe like testicular cancer that has recurred. Uh, for allogeneic transplants, uh, the hematologic malignancies, AML, ALL, and MDS are the, the big three, of course. There's also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, aplastic anemia, CML. So when we talk about unrelated donor transplants, <clears throat> Only 30% of patients will have a matched sibling donor. You can figure out if you have a lot of siblings, the equation is actually 1 minus 0 0.75 to the power of n, where n is the number of siblings you have. You can figure out your chance of having a match. 
So, the majority of people don't have a match. Um, the NMDP was established in 1986, and currently there are more than 16 million volunteer donors. Uh, if you're from uh, North, North European ancestry, um, you have 80% of the Caucasian patients will likely find a, a donor. However, only 20, 20 to 40% of African Americans or other minority patients will be unable to find a match. And this is a problem. Um, I just want to, this is an interesting study that looked at the utilization of curative therapy and transplants in the U.S. Basically what they did, in a nutshell, because it was very complex, um, they looked at the SEER data, the incidence of these diseases. Um, <clears throat> they took out uh, deaths that would occur statistically for induction in AML and ALL, where 8 to 10 percent of people die in, in induction. They took out people who would be uh, ineligible for transplants based on the incidence of renal failure and other reasons why people would be denied a transplant. Then they looked at um, who the number of transplants they were actually doing, and really what they found is that um, bone marrow transplants were really underutilized, underutilized, and actually this is in all areas of the U.S. When you actually look at the numbers, um, it goes into the thousands of uh, potential uh, transplants that are missing, and the reasons really for this are uh, differences in um, healthcare, access, people who are getting referred late for transplant, and also because the patients can't find donors. I hate slides of chromosomes, and I'm only showing one, so <clears throat> I, because I just want to explain when we talk about typing a person, um, when we say a person's a 10 out of 10 match, what we look at is the um, HLA major histocompatibility complex on the long arm of chromosome 6. They're tightly um, uh, to, uh, together, the class 1 and class 2. We look at HLA A, B, and C, D, R, and D, Q. So you get 5 from your mom, 5 from your dad. So if you match, it's a 10 out of 10. Uh, most places now are doing 10 out of 10 matching at the DNA level which is called high resolution. Um, you're really only required by the accrediting body to do an eight out of eight. So when, if you look at literature, you see eight out of eight. Um, but that's what that means. So alternative donors to analogenic stem cell transplant, which we need to uh, turn to more and more. Um, a 10 out of 10 HLA matched sibling donor is a gold standard for comparing survival. Improvements in HLA matching and post-transplant supportive care really have made comparable survival rates for a 10 out of 10 HLA matched unrelated donor. So their the survival rates are equal. So, and for every locus that is uh, mismatched, so if you have a 9 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10, um, for, there's a decrease by 10% in overall survival. So, <clears throat> in the alternative donors, what do we look at? and what are the roles for umbilical cord blood transplants and haploidentical transplants. So 2013 was the 25th anniversary of the first umbilical cord transplant. It was performed in, performed in France in the child with Fanconi anemia. Since then, more than 600,000 cord blood units have been stored, and over 30,000 umbilical cord blood transplants have been performed. Um, it's extended access to transplantation for people who don't otherwise have a, a sibling or unrelated donor, and especially for patients of racial and ethnic minorities. It's also rapidly available. So I know we just talked about 8 out of 8 and 10 out of 10, but because the umbilical cord stem cells are immunologically naive, you don't have to have a strict HLA typing. So Generally, what the uh, rule of thumb is, you can have a four to, four to six to a six out of six HLA matched. Um, you, we look at HLA A, B, and DR. Uh, the DR needs to be looked at high resolution at the DNA level. You can just look at serologic level of the A and B. Um, and then double cord transplant, you have to have, you match them to each other, and then each one has to match to the um, 
to the recipient, but again, you can have a four to six mismatch. The benefits, it's um, abundantly available, easily harvested at the time of birth of the child. Ethically non-controversial, we're not trying to grow organs. Um, the birthing represents genetic background of a given population, so you know um, when you look at a cord search what the ethnic background is. There's low CMV and uh, Epstein-Barr infection, there's no malignant transformation. Lower acute graft versus host disease incident and severity. It's available pretty much on demand. And there's no age-related graft source concerns as you would have if you were, your donor was 80 years old. Um, often their stem cells aren't that good. Disadvantages, it's a one-time only donation. If this patient engrafts and they do fine, but then they start to lose their graft over a period of time, you can't, there's, go back to the three-year-old child and get lymphocytes to do a donor lymphocyte infusion. So it's a one-shot deal. Uh, the engraftment kinetics are slower. They take longer to engraft. And you, you don't know. There's difficulty in determining abnormalities that may not be apparent in the newborn. So that's the risk that you take. So single versus double umbilical cord transplant, basically what this slide is telling you that um, you need a certain number of stem cells per kilogram uh, to transplant a patient. So you don't get really enough stem cells um, from an umbilical cord for your average American adult. What they have discovered that if you use two and <clears throat> you increase the number of stem cells that you can transplant adults, and what will happen is that one graft will become dominant and the other suicidal, so that you really only end up with um, one of the cords becoming dominant. And so this is now pretty much the standard that you use a double umbilical cord transplant. Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, and this shows you, uh, just in terms of usage, um, for adults, which is in green, uh, the increase over the last 10 years of um, unrelated core blood transplants. Haploidentical transplantation, so this is by definition a mismatched transplant. Um, this is where a parent, child, or someone in your family uh, is, is partially matched and considered as a donor, even though they're just a five out of 10. These have generally in the past been a very high risk uh, because of hyperacute graft versus host disease um, <clears throat> uh, and frequent rejection of the graft. Uh, most of this is pioneered at uh, John Hopkins and Fred Hutchinson, um, but is now actually moving into to, uh, mainstream. This is an important paper that was published in 2011, and it looked at two trials. They looked at double umbilical cord transplants, and they looked at um, haploidentical transplants. Patients were less than 70. They had very high-risk disease. Um, they didn't have a suitable match donor. Um, the AML, you had to be in CR, at least a PR for lymphomas. Ten transplant centers um, enrolled in the uh, double umbilical cord trial. Eleven centers enrolled in the haplo marrow trial, and six centers had both. Um, <clears throat> this is what the pre preparative regimen looks like for an umbilical cord transplant. It's a reduced intensity, so you get cyclophosphamide and fludarabine. You get to total body radiation um, on day minus one in both of them. Uh, and just a, the only difference here is that in the haploidentical, you get on um, day four and five uh, cyclophosphamide. Okay, um, five minutes, so I'm gonna, this is, um, this looked at relapse in the umbilical cord transplant in the marrow. Again, there's no p-values here uh, because there are parallel studies. I'm gonna, I did put this in chart form right here. Um, so acute graft versus host disease, two to four, uh, grade two to four, 40% 40 versus 32%. Severe graft versus host disease was zero with the haplomero, um, and 20% with double umbilical cord. Uh, chronic graft versus host disease at one year, 25 versus 13. Non-relapse mortality at one year was 24% versus only 7% for the haplo. Uh, 
Uh, relapse was higher in the haplo at 45% versus 30. Overall survival at six months, which was their prime uh, endpoint, 74% from umbilical cord, 84 for haplo. Progression-free survival at one year, 46 and 48%. And overall survival at one year was 54 and 62, which is good for these high-risk diseases that they were transplanting. And what this has led to is now that there is a, um, from the bone marrow transplant clinical trial network, is a randomized trial, basically m mimicking the study, um, only you're randomizing between a double umbilical cord transplant or a haploidentical. The only caveat is you have to have both. You have to have cord blood that you, in, in the search, and you have to have a haploidentical um, sibling or family member, and then you get randomized. And this is a protocol that we are hoping to uh, open at Roger Williams within the next year. Just in closing, um, <clears throat> advantages and disadvantages, umbilical cord transplants, um, difficult to find high quality units. Um, they're expensive, $20,000 to $40,000 per cord. Um, there's no general lymphocyte available, low risk of graft versus host disease, high risk of infection, product quality is highly variable, relapse risk is moderate. For haploidentical, um, most patients have a parent or child as a donor, uh, low donor acquisition costs, uh, Donor lymphocyte infusions will be readily available. Graft versus host disease can be severe. Um, infection is a very high risk. Uh, product quality is uh, low variability. And the relapse risk is high, especially with some forms of T cell depletion. And with that, uh, thank you.